uh, I just want you to take notice of three scriptures which are important. I want you to just take notice of them, keep them in your mind, in your heart, or write them down somewhere, and uh, just keep them there, okay? The first one is Hebrew 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, which it says, it's a very simple scripture, Now faith is the substance of things hopeful, the evidence of things that are not seen. Please keep that in mind. Hebrew chapter 11, verse 6 says, that without faith it is impossible to praise Him. For he that come to God must believe that He is, and He, uh, the rewarder of them, the very gently seek Him. Now keep that in your storage as well. In Romans, the Apostle Paul says like this, Now faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I want these three scriptures, they are one. They are part of one major thing, one point, one thing. First, uh, the, the things that you hope for are the things that you don't see, but uh, you hope for them. Second, it is that to hope for those things that will also uh, reward and please God. And therefore, those are the things that we are hoping for. Third, Paul said that uh, faith comes by hearing. And therefore, hearing what? Definitely not the television. It is not the radio. It is not politics. But hearing one thing only, the Word of God. So the three things are chained together. They are part of one. And I wish that the Lord will make you and me understand the importance of those three things in which are so important in order to live a life that is pleasing unto, unto God. Faith is generated by the Word of God. And we, as we hear the Word of God, so faith then, uh, uh, as we hear the Word of God in faith, is where the Word of God, it is written, and because it is written, it is going to be done, is finished, is done, is over. That's what faith really is all about. It is written, it is done. That's it. There is no in between. It is written and it's done. Now keep that in mind, I'm not going to touch that again, uh, not, at least not today anyway, because my mind is in some, my spirit is to something else. It was only in a um, few nights ago that the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night. Now somebody said that I had a dream. Well, I don't have dreams. I'm not old enough for dreams. The Bible says that the old men had dreams. I'm not that old yet for that dream. So, but one of these days maybe I will. But as the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night or early hour of the day of the of the night, there is something that came into my mind, very very clear, and the word was impossibility, impossibility. And I said, Lord, what does all that mean? What is this impossibility? Then the Lord began to deal me about this word. We must be getting used to the impossibility. As the people of God, we must get used, by the, the Lord said, we must get used to see the things that are not as they are. We, might have to, we have to start to get used to be able to see the impossibility of the world become a possibility for the people to serve God. Therefore, there is this substance in your heart this morning there is a possibility in the dream that you have, in the thought that you have, in the things that you are aspiring from with the deepest of your heart. Even if they seem impossible, they will be possible because you are a child of God. <laughs> the Lord spoke to me and I saw a few people in the church as they were speaking to me and I will probably deal with that very soon, very quickly, the sooner the better. When it's in your mind, the first thing you want to do is just to be able to get. The first thing the Lord spoke to me in saying 
to the leader of the church. The leader of the church is the pastor, of course. And the Lord said to the pastor, because you have known, I have told him this before, but I feel that the church must know and hear, because you have not asked for silver and gold, that you have asked for souls, therefore, said the Lord, I will give you the desire of your heart, because that is also the desire of, your, of my heart. There will be a whirlwind coming within the church. That whirlwind will bring people from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They will come, for I have made this place an emergency spiritual place for the people who are in need in the wind and in the area. So the whirlwind will go and the people will come. Many will be restored facing the presence of God. They will be re reinforced in their spirit, in their life, and many will go and will not stand. But thus said the Lord, do not worry about those who are going, because I will use them in the place in which I have placed them, and revival will keep going in the restoration of the church for the kingdom of God. And that is what God is going to do. And I believe with all of my heart that that is the word, not just for the pastor, but is the word for every person within the church. These are the things that have Impossibility. How can it happen? How can a whirlwind come within the church? Impossibility. But it's happened before. We'll go into that in just a few minutes. Angus, I had a word for you from the Lord. Thus said the Lord, your, your heart is filled with a desire of serving God. The Lord knows that you want to make uh, make uh, the devotion and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and the music an instrument in order to people that will come and search and see God. It will given the Lord has given you the talent, and therefore it's going to happen. In very short time, you will have a vision, a vision of the heavens. If it is a vision, or if it is just the rapture of the moment, I don't know. But you will see the angels of God surrounding the throne of God, praising and glorifying God. Your heart will be so enthused and touched by that particular vision that those who are playing with you and being there with you in, the, in, in, in use of the instrument of music, they will be charged by the power of God and the word of God and the, and, and the music will touch the heart of the people and many will respond for the glory of God. That is for you. It is written, it is done. And therefore, we are expecting it. The Lord said, I have seen your heart, I am working in your family, and it will be not too long that your husband and your children will be coming to the presence of God, because I have opened the Lord. And whenever you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you get saved, and your family will be saved also. It is written, it is done, for the glory of God. Thank you, God. The Lord said, Come with their problem, 
God will give you a spiritual insight to be able to solve their problem and to help them and to send them out, praising and glorifying the name of the Lord. God will use you and your home for His glory and for His kingdom. And as a proof that the Lord is going to do it, as a sign, the pain that you have will disappear from you from now not too long, and that is a sign that God is going to use your home. Possibility, the thing that cannot happen anywhere, they will happen because you're walking in the Spirit. Yes, yes. The things that are impossible to even think of because are not achievable, they can be achievable because you are walking with God. I saw suddenly the impossibility that the Jewish people were facing. One minute, they were living after 400 years of slavery. They were leaving Egypt. They were filled in the excitement, filled with the presence of God. They were all praising and glorifying God as they walked out of Egypt with all the silver and the gold. And they were walking down with all that they had. And as they walked down, they must have made the wrong turn because instead of going toward the desert, they went toward the Red Sea. Suddenly they stopped there. They couldn't go forward because the sea was there. Somebody began to cry from the back. The army of the Egyptians are coming. The heart of the people began to sink. They did their hope began to come to short their hope became to nothing. They became afraid, the Bible said. They were afraid and they were stumbling because they knew that the Egyptians were coming. They were having, and it was impossible for them to fight them and therefore they were going to go back into Egypt, into the same slavery that they had left before. The sea was in front of them. They could not cross over. It was impossible. And there was an impossibility in there that they could not that they could not fathom. But Moses stood up. He got up into the mount to the highest peak. And he said to the people, fear not. That's the first thing you have to do when you come before the presence of the Lord, before any kind of impossibility. The first thing it is to do is fear not. Stand still. Don't do anything. 
We are up to do something. We want to do something. We want to be able to control our own life and do things in our own way. But the Bible says to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Who is the salvation of the Lord, may I ask? The Lord Jesus Christ Himself. So the Lord was there, right in the middle of the people. And the people were there, and they prepared for their salvation. And suddenly, when the Lord Jesus is present, my friend, the Spirit is always present. You ask for the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will get as a benefit in your life the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when you ask for Jesus, the Holy Spirit will come. And because the salvation of the Lord was there, declared by Moses himself, the presence of the Holy Spirit was there too. The wind began to blow and smack the sea right into the middle and part of the water and then walked right through. The impossibility can be made possible by the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The next thing that I saw, it was another impossibility. Pastor Neil preached many times about David and Goliath, Samuel, chapter 17, verse 37. Here we have the army of the Lord, or Israel, and the Philistines on the other side. They were facing each other, but they were not engaging into a war because there was some impossibility in the middle. That impossibility, his name was Goliath. He might or say that he was bigger than any other man. Much bigger than me, probably twice, three times my size. He was so big that they trained him to war when he was just a little boy. Because he was so big, he could be a very good soldier, a very good warrior. Then they built an armor. Now he couldn't wear the armor that everybody else was wearing because he was too big. And therefore they had to build an armor made of bronze which was thicker and bigger than any other armor of anybody else. Now, if you are a normal soldier, will you engage somebody like that? When you're going with the spear, his armor is so strong that the spear will break and the armor will do a thing. He had a helmet that would cover his back. He had faces coming down to his, uh, flags coming down to his face. The helmet alone, you read it in the Bible, it was made of hard bronze and it could beg, it withstand any blow. Nobody could break that helmet. It was impossible. And then the helmet, the helmet also had a flag in front of his eyes. His nose was covered. His cheeks were covered. His back was covered. His head was covered. His eyes were covered. Tell me, what chance does have a little stone to get him and hit him right on the forehead? Tell me, impossible. That's right. It couldn't happen. Now, I, I, I let something come. Now, here, what made it possible? Then they said, you come against me with spear and sword, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Yes. That what made it possible. The same Lord that was up in the Red Sea is the same Lord that is now by, used by David himself. So he went down to the brook. He took five stones. It doesn't make any difference. If they were made of mud or stones or whatever they were made, they were picked up in the name of the Lord. And when they are picked up in the name of the Lord, they become a weapon. And when he took that stone and he threw up Goliath, that stone that was going became more, uh, 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 it got more velocity, more speed as it was going to go toward Goliath. The, the stone became so hard that it broke the heart, the heavy helmet that he had that nobody else could break. But he broke it and he went 
and he killed them and he fell down. The impossibility became possible because of the name of the Lord of hosts. It can happen. What is your Goliath today? How are you trying to fight it? Sometimes you try to. I'm going to fast 45 days. I'm going to pray for 25 hours. I'm going to do this for that. I'm going to do that for that. My friend, you don't have to. Just go down to the brook, pick up five little stones, and no matter how small they are, maybe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you throw them to Goliath, and he will go flat to the ground. There is no other way. Impossibility becomes possibility in the name and for the glory of God. Goliath was, uh, was very well trained in the art of war since he was a child. He could handle, uh, the, his, his armor could handle any blow from anybody else, from everybody. His sword was longer than anybody else, so you had no ch chance getting close to him. He, Goliath was a superior soldier with better armor and deadly weapons. But David was not fighting alone. He was king in the name of the Lord yes. of hosts, yes. which it means the name uh, of the Lord of many people or many angels. Impossibility, they become possibility. Let me go to another one. This probably is the last one. I uh, <clears throat> realized that the uh, time goes. Yes, that's what they all tell me. I'm going to see how long it's going to take. That's okay. Now, there is something here that I want also as a closing down. And by closing down doesn't mean I'm going to be down in five minutes. That I'm just closing down the thoughts in which I have shared with you this morning. The first about faith, the second about the impossibility of things to happen. Acts of the Apostle chapter 3 from verse 6, he says that Peter and John usually went to the temple for prayer. We usually go to the shed, or what you want to call there, on Tuesday for prayer. That's good. Well, I do it normally now. I know that this is a Tuesday night, it's a night of prayer, so I just don't do anything else, don't go anywhere else. I just go for the night of prayer. Because I usually go. On Sunday, I come to church. Why? Because I'm used to go to church. I've been doing it for the last... Forget it, I'm not that <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and so, that therefore, I keep doing it. And it doesn't bother me, it doesn't worry me. I just usually do. And Peter and John, they were going to the temple every morning for prayer. So every morning, John comes up to Peter, knocks at the door, come on, Peter, let's go. We are going to the temple for prayer. He said, oh, yes, another day. So he just got up and they went. And they walked up to the temple. But every morning that they were going by, there was a man there that was asking for alms because he could not work. He was a paralytic and therefore he could not really be able to support himself. He was there and who knows how many times Peter and John went by and they, as they went by, they saw him there and said, oh, it's okay, it's okay, keep going. Uh, yeah, well, it's okay. Let the rich people take care of him. I mean, after all, why shouldn't the people that have money help him? Why do I have to help him? I don't have enough. I'm poor. I'm a fisherman. I don't have that much money. And then when I got, I, I, I forgot about being a fi when I, uh, I wasn't a fisherman anymore, I became a Pentecostal preacher. That makes it even poorer than <laughs> So if why do I have to help him? Let the scribes and the Pharisees and the doctors and the people from the temple, let them help him. 
take up the money, let them help him. And so one day went by, they went to pray, yes, Lord, oh, bless me, bless me. Then they went home. Then the following day, the same thing. Oh, I uh, let the people that got money go by. But then, in the middle of the night, Peter had some kind of a touch from the presence of God. Now, things are different when the Lord touches you. You know that. When you have a touch of God, things become different. So he was very happy this morning and he was singing and he was praising God and the usual knock at the door. Here is John and John said, come on Peter, we are going to prayer. Uh, we are going to the hour of prayer. We are going to pray. And so let us go together. And Peter and John, they went, Peter said to John, yeah, yeah. He said, today I feel good. I really want to go and go for prayer. Well, to the prayer meeting. I'm going to see something of the presence of God. I'm going to go to the prayer meeting. Try sometimes. It'll help you. And and, uh, and Saul said, they, when they come, and, and he was so happy. He was walking down and he said, praise God. Thank God. He blessed me. He blessed my soul and there was the man blind. He was still there. He hadn't moved. <laughs> nobody helped him and nobody touched him and nobody said anything. So he went by. He looked with the corner of his eye and he was just going by there. Then all of a sudden something got in his heart. And he said um, to John, he said, John, just wait a minute. <clears throat> I gotta make a confession. Poor fellow. And he said, friend, I've been passing by here every morning. I've seen you asking for arms. But you're asking for money and I don't have any money. See, I'm a poor fisherman. And as a poor fisherman, I just make enough to for my own family. And he said, now I'm a they made me a Pentecostal preacher, but it doesn't help very much. He said, I just don't have much, much things. He said, but I, I, I like to share my testimony with you. He said, Jesus came from heaven. He died on the cross. He was resurrected. And then he told us, he said, go to Jerusalem and wait there until you receive power from heaven. So he said, uh, about 500 of us. We went to the upper room and we began to wait for the Lord to come. And we waited and we waited and we waited. 380 got tired of waiting. They just left. And only 120 of us were left over there. He said, 10 days went by. But when the time came, suddenly something strange happened. He said, friend, you know what happened? We saw, actually saw, tons of fire. Tons of fire upon the head of the people. And they were all with the tongues of fire. And he said, we were looking at them and we were amazed at what's happening. Suddenly, he said, the wind began to flow, blow. And when the wind began to blow, he started fading the fire. Fading the fire, the flames. And those flames began to come into our head. Our head became clear. Suddenly, we started to praise God and glorify God because the fire of God that cleanse our hair, our head. Now we are fine. We are great. We are praising God and shouting and yelling and praising the Lord with all of our heart and with all of our might. With all of our might. You know, my friend, it was sensational. Then that fire, the, 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 the wind became, uh, continued to blow and the fire came down into our heart. Our heart was restored. Our heart was made new. Our heart was made great. He said, I began to speak in tongues. I never had it. I never went to school. But he said, I spoke a, a language that nobody, that I never had learned or understood. Things were amazing, my friend. Suddenly, he said, the heart was so filled with the presence of Jesus that I looked out in the window and I saw a large crowd of people that were all there. My heart was so moved with compassion by, by the love of Jesus that I began to preach them and I began to tell them to repent and receive the Lord. And he said, oh, a miracle. 3,000 people got saved because we were preaching Jesus Christ, the Son of God. My friend, he, we had a tremendous opportunity over there. Then he turned to 
John. And he said, John, can you verify that? And John said, yes, my friend, it is true. It did happen. Then Peter said, silver and gold, I don't have it. Silver and gold, I don't have it. But what I have, uh-huh. How did he get it? The fire, the wind, the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. He got all of those things, what I have. Do you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yes. Do you know that Jesus is now living in your heart? Yes. Do you know that they don't have to wait until tomorrow, the day after, but now Jesus is living in your heart. And Peter said, what I have, I give unto you. What do I have? I have Jesus with all His power, with all His glory, with all His mighty, with all His power for glory. And what I have, I am going to give it to you. Get up and go. And you know what happened? He got up and he began to walk and praising God and went to the temple. And they were all amazed of what was happening. What did the subject here? The impossibility can become possibility. But how do they become possibility? If by knowing that Jesus said, I will never leave you, never forsake you, but I will be with you. I will be living inside of you. And when we have that knowledge so fully and correct in our mind, we can stretch our hand. It is not our hand, but it's the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is goes through our hand. Because the Holy Spirit is what is leading us in doing something. And when we do it, it's the power of Jesus that is moved into the mind, into, into the one person, into the other person. And the glory of God will happen. The impossibility is going to happen. And I expect the revival to come But it is possible by the glory of God and the presence of the Lord Jesus. Do you feel stressed because you are living at this moment in the desert? You have the Red Sea in front of you and you have the Egyptian army behind you. You feel that you're getting squeezed in. It seems that you cannot break down of that mold. Remember, you can break down in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you feel that way, you don't have to leave this place without being released by the presence of God. Do you feel like you have a big Goliath in front of you? You cannot go, go close to him because his spear is so long. You can even get close to him. There is no way that you can really fight him and therefore it is impossible for you to be able to fight him. There is no way that you can actually release yourself in order to get him out of the way. In the New Testament, he doesn't talk about Goliath, but he talks about a mountain. Is there a mountain in front of you? Do you open up the windows of your life in the morning and you see a mountain right in front of you that is impossible to funnel through and is impossible to go through, is impossible to move? Thus said the Lord, in Jesus' name you ask the mountain to be removed and it will be done because it's done by the power and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have a Goliath or a mountain, just stand up for a minute. Just stand up right now. If you feel like that you are stretched by the Red Sea, just stand up. There is a release in this place. There is a release in the presence of the Lord Jesus. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. That is not what I want. But if there is an impossibility in your life right now, I want you to look up to Jesus. 
don't look up to him be look up to Jesus I'm here only to represent the Lord Jesus Christ and because I represent him I am going to ask for that mountain to be removed in Jesus name I'm going to ask for that Goliath to be slain in Jesus name and I release the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ upon your life right now in Jesus name 